My name's Adele Onyango and welcome to another episode of Legally Clueless. No, seriously, I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Hey you, welcome to episode 291 of Legally Clueless. Thank you so much for rocking with this podcast. OG members, nothing but love, 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 and more love for you. And if you're new to this podcast, welcome. Episodes like this go out every single Monday. We have the Midweek Tease show that goes out on Wednesdays. And on Fridays, we have Ask a Therapist. But back to this episode, this is what's coming up. And then I decide, you know what? Let me speak up about my mental health to my parents. Because I think that was something we didn't touch on it so, so much when they were there. So I was like, let me actually be upfront about this and just tell them I need to see a therapist. So I bring up the issue with them and I tell them I'm really going through the most and I need to see a therapist. Issues around mental health, it's not a topic or a subject that most black households or African households still talk about till date. I brought that up and obviously my parents were like, you know, mental health, what is that? You know, you're in London, you're in a good university. What do you mean you have mental health problems? Like, what what do you mean? We might be a spoiled brat. That is part two of Fiona's story. If you haven't listened to episode 290, please do, because that's where you'll find part one. But back to the newbies. If you want to officially join the family, head over to our website, legallycluelessafrica.com. Sign up and you'll be receiving letters from me. There's a link to our website in the show notes. There's also a link to our YouTube channel that is (laughs) jam-packed. There's so much activity happening there. I am so impressed by you know, the work that we're putting in here, because one of the things that's going on on our YouTube is our East Africa tour. We are halfway through the season of weaving through Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Uganda. And one of my favorite places to go to during the tour was definitely Gulu. It was my first time in Uganda, first time in Gulu. First and foremost, you know, like when we let other people tell our stories as Africans, the stories come out either biased or just so one-sided. So a like Gulu, you only ever hear about the unsettled past. If it's issues around war and insecurity, you don't get a full picture of the area. And Gulu is, oh my goodness. First, it's so huge. (laughs) Secondly, super developed, super vibrant, the food delicious, the pineapple so sweet, the people so friendly, so much creativity, so much industrialization, so many NGOs. It just feels like there's so much opportunity in Gulu right now. It was such an honor to be able to tell that story. One of the people we met is Flavia. And so this week on our YouTube channel, we discover hidden gems in Gulu. Trust me, we found the best (laughs) creative spot. And we also meet Flavia. Here's a snippet of her story. On finishing um, secondary high school, I had no hopes. I totally had no hopes because uh, with mommy, I felt like, no, she cannot afford this. How will I make it? So um, because I used to relate well with friends and friends used to see how I could struggle. Sometimes I stay home months or two without going back to school and I report late. They're like, no, Flavia, I I, I had a friend whom we had gone through uh, primary together. So she had a sister. This sister of hers, who was again my friend, tells me, Flavia, there is a scholarship that my sister applied for. Can you try? This time they're taking people. So I was like, okay, if it is like this. And it was the first of its kind for yeah. us to get luck in yeah. our family. Yeah. Because even my my parents, they didn't get anything to do with luck. So we yeah. never believed in that. Yeah. And that was a turning point that I was like, God does everything. Yeah. You know? So uh, I, I tried. And um, my, my village is in Amuro district. Okay. So uh, my mom's village. So I, I had to rush because this scholarship is only based there. Yeah. I went there confidently, got the form, filled it. Yeah. And yeah, we were waiting for announcement. So I, I, I was so happy. I went home. I shared with my parents. I was like, somehow my dad didn't want it. Okay. What did he want he, you to he, do? He, he didn't. Okay. Uh, it's not that he didn't want it. 
I think it's because they, they never believed in luck, something happening just mm. for free. And somehow, because a girl, I was a girl, they thought maybe there was someone yeah. trying to, you know, push me to do certain things. Yeah. So at some point, I was like, no, to hell with this. For yeah. the first time, I had to put my parents' advice down. Wow. And I did it myself. Yeah. So I, I went ahead, applied, and when my name came, that day, I don't know where it was a God's planning. We were seated home. We were all listening to radios. We hardly listened to radios. <laughs> then they say uh, scholarships. Then they read our names on radios. So oh, my what? goodness. So you then had your name? Yeah. Oh, wow. Then immediately, they, uh, they had to call. Yeah. Give a call. I had a Canops phone, yeah. <laughs> a small one. I, I, I could not access, uh, afford uh, smartphones. So. Yeah. They just called me, and I picked up. And it's like, Flavia, tomorrow, please come here. That whole story changed, changed everything. Yeah. Everything. This scholarship, uh, it's a MasterCard uh, Foundation yeah. scholarship. Yeah. It's based in Nairobi. Yeah. But they have a, a, a brand or, or companies that they're partnering with. That is FAO Uganda yeah. chapter. With them, uh, they will sponsor girls, mm -hmm. girl child there. They're promoting girl child education. Yeah. And from my village... I think uh, we are among the 14 few girls who got, there were no girls. Looking at that, uh, I was a bit sharp. Yeah. <laughs> I was sharp. And I had to penetrate through things sharp, in a sharp way without help. Having joined the, the scholarship, I think uh, there is a, a leadership a bit of me that mm -hmm. I think it was, it was silent. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, waiting. It was waiting yeah. for that right moment. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I applied and they called us and we had an induction. That induction exposed us to, to what we call leadership. Yeah. And I was directly appointed by colleagues to, wow. to lead them. So you yeah. study teaching in, in Guli University and the scholarship allows you to like tap into a passion that you didn't really know mm. you had. Mm. And so what happens after you you graduate? Education was not my, my, my dream. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. But uh, the scholarship made me. On doing, during the course, yeah, I was on scholarship, but I was also working. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just volunteering, doing other work. And uh, through that, I tried to know that uh, community that brought me up is what I need to give back to. Mm -hmm. Through that volunteering, it, it exposed me to that kind of community that I was in, yeah. that they needed someone mm -hmm. like me to change and transform someone's mm -hmm. life. So I, I could go uh, volunteer, help people, young people, talk to them, and tell them my story yeah. to change their stories. Exactly. Through that, I, I, I felt like, yeah, I'm not so good at class. Yeah. Okay, I, I did it well, but I was like, no, this is not my calling. Yeah. My calling is getting back to that community. Yeah. Yeah. So I went ahead, and that is why I, I went to community facilitation. Okay. That is work. Yeah. Giving life skills. And so, mm -hmm. so you go back into the community, um, and you're teaching life skills, etc., in Gulu. Yeah. So then, how do you move from Gulu to South Sudan? When does that happen? A friend of mine whom we went to the same university, she wasn't my tribe mate. Yeah. She wasn't just, just a classmate. Yeah. She calls me, Flavia, I think you can do this. These people want someone like you. Yeah. Send in your application. Next week you're coming. It's like, okay. Since I, I had that dream of visiting South Sudan, I was like, okay, ah, I, yeah. it's a dream come true. Okay. So I was like, no, let me go. So I, I, I really made it. Uh, I didn't tell anyone. I just Why? made my move. <laughs> no, I, I, because sometimes yeah. we have already that perception that South Sudan is not a safe place. Uh -huh. Okay. Telling my parents they wouldn't wish to lose someone yeah. like me in the family. Yeah. So I was like, no. Mm, Flavia, until you're on the way, then tell them. So I, on arriving, I, I, I did everything. And arriving so in South Sudan is I, when I you... I call them, you call, I'm in South Sudan. And uh, don't worry, things yeah. will be okay. <laughs> don't worry. So they had, no, <laughs> they, had, yeah. they had no chance of telling me, please come back yeah, or why yeah. did you go? I was like, yeah. this is work. And yeah. what was the job exactly you were um, going to it's, do? Um, well, they wanted me to go and teach the communities, just the community mm -hmm. uh, facilitation that is uh, giving life skills, mm. uh, communication skills, which, which sides with networking skills that the children need, the mm -hmm. community their needs. So basically that's conflict management yeah. and all those. So I was like, okay, since um, they also want a teacher, I think I, I do this and also this. So they needed that both combination. Yeah. So I was like, okay, let me go. And so when you were there, were there moments that validated your move? Like, is there a moment with any students that 
you had so much impact or you saw so much change in that particular student that you were like, this is why I'm doing this job and this is why I'm here? Okay, reaching there, first of all, I was used to teaching first learners and then going to a, an environment where uh, you have literally students who are traumatized, mm. exactly. So traumatized, how will they pick up this? Yeah. And then um, me being a foreigner, and I can't adjust my English. Yeah. They don't know English to that yeah. extent that I know. It was very hard. Mm -hmm. So there they use Arabic and Tomoja. I was like, those two languages? And I didn't and know you didn't anything. know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was like, no, I will stick to this English. First of all, it will help them yeah. learn this. Yeah, so that I was just on my English. Mm. And they're like, some of them was like, madam, how did you make it? Madam, they, they used to admire how I do my things. Mm come and I just give them I was like you know I do it then at point they they asked me so why did you decide to come here at that point that gave me the space to to really explain why I was doing that mm -hmm. and why I chose to go there yeah first of all I started with my my experiences yeah they say it's just not about where you are things can change mm -hmm. Things can change. So some, most of them were really demoralized by life. They mm. say, do you have war? The other side is like, mm. no, mm. there is always war. But how do you solve this war? Yeah. How do you come about certain things that you can control? Those are the aspects of life that I... I. Yeah. So when I didn't go back, honestly, I had calls yeah. from all over. Madam, why didn't you come? And then oh. I, I just told them I have family yeah. that I, I needed to attend to. Yeah. And I felt, I felt touched. And Today I wish I could go, but yeah. honestly, um, life is precious. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it was a tough one. It was a tough one. Were you scared say. when you made that decision? Like, I'm going back to Gulu. Yeah, I was scared. Yeah. I was scared. I, I had to hold my decision. Yeah. I had to hone it 100% because it was me making yeah. it. Mm -hmm. When you came back to Gulu, did you have a plan of what it is you were going to do? Or like, were you just like a bit scared because uh, there's no plan? Honestly, yeah. I had no plans. Yeah. But I know, uh, I know whenever I'm in Gulu, Anything comes up. Um, and that was I'm 100% sure yeah. because at least I, I do little things that hand me money. Yes. Uh, on contracts. On, yeah. And this is what I'm doing right now. This is my first time in Gulu. Yeah. And so I may not have heard a lot more about Gulu mm. outside of the bits in its past that mm -hmm. are like troubled, right? Because that normally happens with a lot of African countries and mm. cities and etc. We only have like one story. You know, mm -hmm. you'll hear if something is wrong, that's the story that you hear about that. So for someone who has never heard a lot about Gulu, mm -hmm. what is the one thing you wish people knew about Gulu that you think they don't know? Wow. I want people to know that Gulu is a very peaceful place. Yes. Peaceful, no one disturbs you. Yeah. The only moment they disturb you is when you disturb someone. <laughs> Which happens anywhere. <laughs> it happens anywhere. <laughs> Normal place, yeah. anywhere else. We have been burning in the sun. <laughs> And I know that you have a very special place you want to take us that's going to help me cool down. Okay, I'm um, going to take you to the nectar. Okay, so yeah. she has juice and She has ice juice, ice cream, and I don't know if you'd mind taking beers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cold. <laughs> Whatever is cold, I'm going to say. Sure, we'll, we'll check it. So if you head over to our YouTube channel, there's a link in the show notes. You get to watch our adventures in Gulu and you also get to meet Flavia, who is an alumni of the Massacred Foundation Scholars Program. We teamed up with them for our East Africa tour and you can learn more about this program and the scholarships that might actually work in your favor like they did for Flavia and so many other Africans we met on the tour. All you have to do is check out our show notes. There's a link that once you click it, you'll get more information. Now, imagine a pad ATM. Like, you know how we go to the ATM, put in your card and you get out of cash? Imagine the same thing, but for sanitary pads. Yes, giving girls across Kenya free pads. Now, stay listening to this episode to the very end 
to meet the woman installing pad ATMs across Kenya. Very excited for you to meet her. Right now, let's jump into 100 African Story. It's part two of Fiona's story. She's in London, battling seasonal depression, not enjoying it, and she shares what comes next. 100 African Stories on Legally Clueless. Stories from Africa. I am literally just angry, I'm sad, I'm irritable. And they're just like, okay, I wonder what's going on with her. Like, is she okay? Like, is she fine? And of course, I just tell them, like, I'm not really, I'm not really enjoying this. I feel like I'm not finding my people. I'm not finding, I'm not making friends that I genuinely want to make. I'm finding it difficult to navigate. I don't feel like people are as friendly. And one thing about the UK is that they, there's a huge beer culture in the UK that I didn't mention. So in the so in London, for example, if you really want to like be out there and make friends, you have to like drink. It's like drinking is like the most socially like what do I call it? It's like how people socialize. And to make friends, a lot of times you have to be in these places. Like you have to drink basically. You have to be drinking. There's a huge beer culture in the UK. So majority of the time, if you want to make friends, just go to the pub. Everyone's always in the pub. And so if that's not really your vibe, then you kind of will struggle. But I also just think in general, making friends as an adult is difficult. It's not the same way as like when we were children. So fast forward to 2022, beginning of 2022, winter is at its peak. I'm thoroughly depressed. I'm crying every day. I am still having to show up for school and making sure that my grades don't slip. At this point, I had, that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to move back. I'm moving back in September. I was like, I'm definitely moving back. I cannot deal with this. There was nothing that was going right for me. So I decided, you know what? I'm going to start planning my return home at that time. But at the same time, I started looking for jobs in the UK as well. So I was like, it's dependent on how it works out. I'll look for jobs in the UK, but my plan B, I'll be looking for jobs at home. And that, during that period, I'm obviously still going through my depression. I'm isolating. I'm crying every day. I'm in the pits. And then I decided, you know what, let me speak up about my mental health to my parents because I think that was something we didn't touch on it so, so much when they were there. So I was like, let me actually be upfront about this and just tell them I need to see a therapist. So I bring up the issue with them and I tell them I'm really going through the most and I need to see a therapist. Of course, you know, like the issue, issues around mental health are not, it's not a, it's not a topic or a subject that most black households or African households still talk about till date. For some reason, it's a very foreign concept to black parents that you could be possibly suffering from. What is that? To them, they don't understand what that is. And it's so funny because I think they also are or have been depressed multiple times in their life, but they didn't know what that was. They didn't know what to do and how to deal with it. So they just like moved on with life. So I brought that up and obviously my parents were like, you know, mental health, what is that? You know, you're in London you're in a good university. What do you mean you have mental health problems? Like, what, what do you mean? You know, you're a, you might be a spoiled brat. You know, it took a bit of convincing. And I, obviously my mom hopped on, my mom got on board. She got to understand the, what I was going through. But my dad was the one who was still a bit like, I, mental health, mm, girl, no. Eventually they hopped on board. So in the UK, luckily, access, so first thing I did was I reached out to the university. I told them, um, I'm not okay, I'm not coping. I am going through this and this. And they referred me to a school counselor who told me, I think you should definitely just start seeing a therapist. So then I decided, you know what? Okay, let me, luckily the UK has got, again, things are more developed and advanced there. So there was this website called Better Health where you could go and get a therapist. And you could, you basically, like you had options to pick what kind of therapist you wanted. You could tailor it to your preference, whether you wanted a male or a female, whether you wanted black or Caucasian, whether you wanted a Christian or a non-Christian. It was so specific. So I did that and I was able to get a therapist who walked with me for about a month and helped me just unpack everything that I was dealing with. Because I think, and that's usually the problem with isolation, and I, I always say, if you can avoid isolating yourself, and that's something I wish I was more intentional about, like just not isolating. I remember my friends would invite me to go places, like the few friends I had, and I, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go anywhere. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't, ha I, didn't, I didn't have any interest in anything in that city, by the way. I always say, like, if you can avoid isolating, because when you isolate yourself, 
you now like you're in your you live in your head 24 7 you overthink things you overthink life you come up with false scenarios you basically make yourself miserable um at that point she walked with me for a month i unpacked a lot of things that i was dealing with a lot of inadequacies i was feeling you know you're also in a big city you're seeing how wealthy people are you're seeing how good people are living life you're seeing everything and you're like okay wow well, you know people are living life you know and you're just there like whoa this is so tough this place is so expensive and i remember even like having to you know you have to kind of get a part-time job because i mean it's not a must i mean depending on what kind of family you come from but of course i for me i had to get a part-time job because the kenyan currency to the pounds was not it was not <laughs> It was not giving. It was not giving. I had to like make sure I got a part-time job so at least I could enjoy a few things. I could enjoy the city. I could do a bit of, you know, excursions, go eat out or whatever. Yeah, so she worked with me and after that, I felt a little bit better. And that's why I always recommend seeing a therapist. <laughs> Um, therapy is, is, I think for me, it's, it's, it's a great thing. So after that, I think whilst my grades were dropping, I was able to kind of collect myself and get it together. But I think I also just, again, overall, didn't, a lot of things didn't entice me in that city. I think even things like going out. I remember I used to love going out so much. And then when I was in the UK, I just didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy the club scene. I didn't enjoy the party scene. I didn't enjoy anything. Literally nothing. <laughs> Crazy. So summer came. And luckily, when summer came and the sun was out, thank the Lord, that changed my mood drastically, right? So seasonal depression is a real thing. Let's just be honest. Seasonal depression is such a real thing. It changed drastically. And thank God the job I was doing allowed for some travel across the UK. So they paid for a couple of trips. I was able to go work in other parts of the UK and travel and see other parts of the UK. So that was a really interesting period in my life because I feel like things just changed and things got so much better. But now... Of course, um, during this time, I was nearing the end of my of my master's, right? And it was also difficult juggling work and school and everything because the thing about doing a master's in the UK is that it's very... You only have one year, and in that year, you have nine months to complete a very rigorous course, you know, coursework. And then the, the other three, you're doing, a, uh, you're doing a dissertation. So it's very packed into, like... It's a lot of information. It's a lot of content content packed in one year or in nine months, rather, that you need to be doing from group assignments to projects to all of that stuff. So it's usually so, so much. It, the content for me itself was not that difficult, but it was just how much I had to do, the assignments I had to do in that little time. So closer to that time now, I was now thinking about, okay, what's happening? It's almost, my, my, my master's is almost over, so I'll be moving back home, and if we move back home, what is the plan? I mean, we had already started thinking about that, but also I was applying to jobs in the UK. Here's the reality of the UK as well when it comes to student visas, right? What happens is when you do either your undergrad or your postgrad, you get, you're, you're eligible to apply for another visa, a post-study visa that grants you about two years for you to stay in the UK and look for work. This visa is great, and I keep saying good for them, but it's a very impractical visa, and quite frankly, a visa to get international students to spend more money in the UK and not really get what they want in return. This is because they say this visa is for you to stick around and get employment, but the most companies, or the, the big companies, will never hire you or will not hire you on temporary visas, right? They'll say, uh, am I going to hire somebody and train them and do all of that for them to leave after two years? So usually what happens is you either get sponsored by a company to go work in the UK or to go work in other parts of the world, especially the big companies. You get sponsorship, right? So this student visa is basically a visa for you to buy time in the UK whilst you're quote-unquote looking for work, but the truth is most organizations will not take you on that visa, especially the big organizations. So it's a, for me, it's, it's like, it's like those visas, that's, it's a, it's been advertised as a good visa, but it's not, it's just a way to get international students to spend more money. And remember as an international student, if you're not on a scholarship, you're paying double tuition fee. There's health, there's health, healthcare that you need to pay for. And it's very expensive. The overall studying overseas, studying in the West is an expensive affair if you're not on a scholarship. So I finish and I'm like, okay, am I getting this visa? And I think about this visa and I think about like, okay, I could get this visa. I'll probably get a job at a mid, small to mid company for sure. But that probably means that at the end of this two years, those companies will not be able to sponsor me a visa. So I will come back home. 
eventually all roads will lead to me coming back home. So there's no need for me to fight this situation. If I can't get a company to sponsor me, then I might as well move back home. And then the other thing that I also wanted to mention was that when you're looking to study overseas, you need to kind of put more thought into what you're going to study. Some degrees are very, sorry, are likely to open up doors for you, i.e. if you're maybe an accounting person, if you're doing actuarial science, if you're doing engineering. I saw the few kids who picked those courses able to navigate because those are SCAR skills. So in the UK, for example, if you're looking to get sponsorship, a lot of times you need to have a SCAR skill. Experience and NASCA skill, which is careers that fall in those fields, accounting and ETC. And those are the people who manage to sort of break through the system and get and get jobs and get sponsorship. Otherwise, if you're just doing your normal, regular business course, if you're doing your liberal arts, if you're doing your marketing, it's unlikely because that is a skill that is there. It's a skill that's there in plenty. So they don't need to pay lots of money to sponsor. You know, sponsoring, it requires a lot of money. For a company to sponsor an individual, it requires a lot of money. So I thought about that. I was like, am I going to buy time in the UK for two years? I will get a job. But the thing is, after those two years, I know I am definitely coming home. Another question I needed to ask myself was, am I willing to, you know, go through this again? Am I willing to keep, you know, to go through whatever I've gone through again? Am I happy here? Is this my happy place? Where would I thrive more mentally? Because I think that people, you know, and, and people will always think, because I've, I've come back home and people are like, why, didn't you, why did you come back? You didn't want to stay? Like, why, why did you come back? And I think I wouldn't stay in, a, you know, people just think when you're in London, when you're in whatever, it's Maisha London. Because that's, the, that's the, percep the perception that people have. It's like, why would you come back to Kenya and you, and you have the option to be in another country? You know what I mean? And that's a question I, I hate being asked and I've been asked time and time again. It's like the first question everyone always asks me, you didn't want to stay there? And I'm like, I mean, this is home. That's not home. You know what I mean? I actually never know how to answer that question and tell them it's just not what you think it is. Anyway, you know, I'm, I'm starting to think now about all my options because September is nearing. I'm doing my dissertation. Um, I need to like have it figured out. I need to know if I'm coming back, what's the what's the game plan? If I'm staying, which I wasn't likely to stay, what would have been the game plan? I started doing interviews that side. Of course, I got rejected because I didn't have the right to work. Um, I needed that visa, and I was just like, am I really applying for this visa? I don't know. I started looking for jobs here as well, and I just wasn't really getting. And that was quite early. Um, but I, I wasn't really getting, I was still getting rejected. Fast forward, I finished my dissertation, I hand in, and that is in the last day of August. I'm now like certain I'm coming back home. So pretty much start packing up and gearing my mind, preparing myself mentally to know that I'm moving back to Nairobi, which for me was so, I was happy because I was like, yeah, I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to reset. I, wanna, I just want to rest. I do, I'm tired of being here. It requires too much energy from me. I also just, I miss home. I miss home. I miss family. So let me go back home. So I do away with all the ideas of me staying. And I, I put that to rest and say, you know what? Let me come back home and do my thing. So before I came back, I, as I was writing my dissertation, so I wrote my dissertation on, it was something concerning, if I can remember, it was a dissertation concerning the startup space and payment systems in Kenya. So as I was doing my research, I came across a startup that was pretty much in the payments space. And I liked what they were doing. So basically, I reached out to them and I told them, hey, like, basically, do you need somebody to do any brand marketing and comms for you? I'm keen. And they said, absolutely, come, come through. So when I moved back to Kenya, first thing, got back, they pretty much gave me the job. And this startup was about, I hope the founder will not see this. This startup was about two years old at the time. So yeah, I got back and literally started working with them. And this was just, again, this for me, I told you was my plan B because coming back from the UK and, and this is and obviously just the expectations that I had for myself, the expectations that my family also had for me was that I would be joining a multinational company. I would be joining a bank, I would be joining, you know, something bigger, right? As I was, up, even as I was at the, at the fintech, I was still applying to these multinational organizations because that was what my definition of success was at that time. That was what my parents' definition of success was at that time as well. And also having seen how my sister's journey went. And this is why I say being a last born is, is the worst. People say being a first born is bad, but I say being a last born is the worst because a lot of times 
you will be told by your parents to follow a trajectory that wasn't even meant for you, right? You'll be told, ah, but you see your big sister or your big brother, they did this and they succeeded and look at where they are now. And that was kind of the dream I was sold a little bit. I was told, yeah, you know, the UK will be a, be a better bet for you. You're likely to now get into the top organizations. And so I, when, when, when I was done with my, with my master's and I saw, and, and this was the reality now, I was at a startup. I was like, but, you know, I, I thought that this was going to open these kinds of doors for me, right? So I decide, you know what, unemployment is not my portion. I say I will work in this startup and I continue to look for a, for a multinational job. And a lot of this, a lot of during this period, I was actually asking myself, like, am I just looking for this multinational because I want to, my parents' validation and my parents, like, my parents to tell me that they're proud of me? Or, like, you know, why am I, why am I so keen for a multinational? Who, who said that that is the definition of success? And who said that because I'm, I have this master's means that this is where I should be, right? So here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit frustrated because, again, if you know, startups are very chaotic, unstructured, you know, very, like, f fluctuating. You know, one time you're doing okay, one time you're not doing okay. So obviously I got, I, just, I got stressed in the startup space and realized that it just wasn't for me. So I decided that I was done. And so now I went into, now I went into unemployment. And during this period now, of course, the aim was to just keep looking for the jobs in these organizations that I want to get into. And here are the challenges that I've faced. So I think one challenge is being overlooked, right? So you'll apply or you'll go to an interview and, you know, you're, you're, you're being interviewed and they can see your credentials. They can see what you've done, what you've achieved. And they, for some reason, feel like you're, you're overqualified, Right. Um, because your peers or the people that you're competing with probably don't have their masters yet or whatever it is that, that you know, they're thinking. So they're thinking mm, this person is overqualified or they're not going to be here for long. They're probably going to just jump ship to the next best thing. So already people overlook you for opportunities because they think, ah, she's already like above this or beyond this. People will automatically cancel you just because of that. And you might think, oh, but it's a good thing to have. It is a good thing, but not everyone will see the value of it, you know, when you're, you know, when you're applying. Because I've been, I've done lots of job interviews and, you know, people just didn't see the value of it. Anyway, uh, fast forward a little bit. I also get my, I, I feel like I didn't mention this and I should have mentioned this before that. Sorry. But yeah, so a highlight or a small win for me was I finished my my master's I came back and then a month later I got my results which I got a distinction I graduated top of my class yeah yeah I graduated top of my class December 2022 I went back for my graduation and that was a very great highlight um amidst everything amidst the mental health problems amidst just being a mess the entire time I was happy that I had a distinction I mean not that it matters and not that anyone cares to be honest, but it was like my little small win that I had this distinction. So of course I keep looking. And I think also one thing that really struck me was how I think in this, in this current like day and age that we're in, people are moving more and more away from the idea or from just like university education. Like it's not, it doesn't carry as much weight as it used to before. And maybe it's just my own observation, but like coming back, of course, from overseas with a master's, you're thinking you have a big head. You're thinking, ah, I'm going to get a good position. I'm going to get into the company that I want because I'm educated. And you realize that like, well, that's not the case. That's, that's, that's not the case. But that's what you think, but that's not the case. So you know, of course, now I'm in this journey of just like still trying. I'm trying to apply to, you know, your big fours, your big tech companies, ETC, ETC. I'm landing interviews. I'm being ghosted by job, by, by interviewer, by interviewers. Yeah, I'm being ghosted. And this has been the trajectory from then since now. I mean, from since, from then till now. Yeah. So, and I think when it comes to unemployment, especially when you, when you're educated, it's, it's something I struggle with a lot. It's really affected like my self-esteem. It's affected, it's made me feel inadequate. It's made me feel like, well, why did I go through all of that if this is the current situation that I'm dealing with? Did I make the right decision coming back home? And as much as I was miserable on the other side, um, was this the better decision? Because obviously you also know the current state of unemployment in Kenya. I mean, almost everyone is a graduate, but a huge chunk of, of us are, are um, unemployed, right? You know, especially with everything that's been going on right now with this current government, it makes, it makes it seem like there's no hope 
for, for us young people. And then now we have to retort into being entrepreneurs because we can't find jobs. You know what I mean? And, and I feel like it's, it has really created some sort of fear um, and worry for us Gen Zs because what does our future look like in this country? Why can't we have the same opportunities? Why do we need to struggle for opportunities in the West? Some of us don't even want to go to the West. We just want to live in Africa and be able to have decent jobs and, and live our lives, literally. But now I think just the way the current state here also forces us to want to go overseas because now that's where opportunities are. But it's also not easy to access those opportunities because they are not very accessible to us. So I think also what has really helped during the season of unemployment is, number one, detaching my worth from my career. Who I am as a person intrinsically, my value is not attached to what I'm doing, my career, nothing. I'm valuable just as I am. I think that's something I had to learn because I was always that babe who was always like, you need to associate me with something. Whether it's something, something, whether whatever it is, whether it's being a master's student, whether it's being this, whether it's working here, whether it's being this career, you always need to associate me with somebody. But who am I outside of that? So even now when I go to events or networking spaces, it's like, who am I? Talk about, your, talk about who you are as a person. What do you like? Don't talk about what you do. Don't talk about where you work. That's not where your identity is. Who are you as a person? I think detaching that has been really helpful because, you know, when you're in seasons like this, when you, you know, you're not really in a, in a specific career, who are you outside of that? Also forging relationships with people. I think that's how I've also been able to just like land, you know, roles in even just like the support community that I was telling you called Women Who Build Africa. Being able to land, being able to connect with people, being able to also um, upskill or find other things to do, other ways to use your skills. You don't always have to use your skills in an employment setting. You can use your skills to give back to society. You can use your skills to do many other things. You can start your own ventures. So I think for me, one thing that I've taken out of this is that you can do a lot of things. It's not just, employment is not just the only thing. Like you can find other ways to better yourself, to upskill, to leverage the resources that you have and do something with your life, even as even as you are still looking for that employment. Um, because for me, I know I want to be a corporate girly. So that's like for me, that's that's a thing. <laughs> I want to be a corporate girly, and I'm not. I'm not. Um, I, I think that's the ultimate goal for now. I'm happy because I'm able to still use my skills. I'm able to still make a difference, make a change. I'm not just like doing nothing about it. And so that's that's like essentially where I'm at in my life right now. And that's what success looks like to me right now. It's about just doing what you can with what you have at the moment, using the resources that you have, forging relationships with people, giving back to society in any way that you can. And I think also it's been very humbling. Like I said, a lot of times when you come back from overseas, you have a big head and you think that the world owes you, you know, opportunities because you're educated or because you've, you've achieved this. I think one thing I've had to learn is the world doesn't owe you anything. It doesn't matter where you're from. You're on the same level as everyone else, you know? Um, I remember when I came back and I was at the startup, I remember like even thinking to myself, I've, I have all this education, but there are people in this room who are so smart, so much, like they're smarter than me. You know what I mean? So it's really been humbling to understand that like you're not better than anyone at any one point, given your status, your education, you're not better, you're not smarter. You don't deserve opportunities because of that. And I think that has also been such a huge lesson for me because you, you're always likely to have a big head when you, when you come back. I'm happy so far. I'm trying to deal with it. It comes in waves. I think it's still very disheartening. Again, also given the trajectory of our current economy, it's very disheartening sometimes, but I think I've made peace with that. And now I'm not I'm still looking for my role, but I'm not particularly like depressed or so sad about my life. Catch more African stories in the next episode of Legally Clueless. Isn't it ironic that it's very hard to get a job when you're armed with your masters, you know? And I think listening to Fiona's story just reminded me of the fallacy we were promised. Go to school, pass. Go to uni, pass. And with that degree, you will unlock a successful life. It was made to be almost automatic that once you get your degree, 
automatically you're getting a job automatically you're going to be successful no struggles right almost that life will get easier and we have very many people discovering that that's just not the case you know there's so much more at play the economic environment luck if you do well in school and not get a job it doesn't mean that something's wrong with you however because of years of being told that once you get that degree you should automatically get a job. It makes very many people who are job hunting with a degree or with a master's feel like they are the problem. You see the issue of how we were socialized? And as Fiona says, you know, maybe even the degree that you have is in a course that's just not marketable anymore. And just listening to a story, I was like, my goodness, the way we approach education, how we teach younger people to view education, especially in Africa, in Kenya, completely needs to change. Even the quality of education, it's almost like, are we equipping young people with skills that are relevant to today's dynamic market? You know, even how we educate the process of teaching from like a young age, it's just like we kind of are setting up young people for failure. We're setting them up to think that something's wrong with them when that's really not the case. But I would love to hear your thoughts on Fiona's story, job hunting when you were armed with a degree or with a master's. How is it for you? Can you relate with the things that she went through? Whatever platform you're listening to this episode on, please share a comment or 10 <laughs> in the comment section. Now, as I said earlier in the episode, we have a new series on our YouTube channel where we are spotlighting bold African women doing incredible things that are impacting communities. And these stories aren't being amplified, you know, and in our own way here at Legally Clueless Africa, we want to have a database of these powerful stories. Honestly, like when I think about this particular series, I think about my nieces and I'm just like, yep, they will have something to watch and see women who look like them, who have names similar to theirs, who are going to places that they know and are doing incredible things. And like my nieces can get inspired. You know what I mean? Not only my nieces, myself, like recording this series has really inspired me. And our comment section is just full of people pouring out feelings of like, wow, we did not know that there are people doing this. I feel so motivated, you know? And for this series, we teamed up with She Walks, which is an initiative by Johnny Walker. And She Walks is spotlighting and celebrating women who are not only making bold choices, but through those choices, many other lives get transformed. And so every Wednesday this month on our YouTube channel, we will be sharing an episode that introduces you to a spectacular woman doing incredible, impactful work. And we've gone to Moranga, we've gone to Kibra, we, ha I'm trying not to give it away. I'm trying not to give it away. <laughs> and, you know, their work ranges from ending period poverty to politics. We just had a shoot two days ago of a woman who is just doing so much necessary work. Hey, when it comes to politics and governance and so make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, turn on notifications because every Wednesday, a new episode in this new series will be going out. Now, episode one features Angela, who is on a mission to place pad ATMs that dispense free sanitary pads in all schools in Kenya. And so we joined her on a trip to Moranga, where one lucky school was getting one of these ATMs. It was out of this world. And on the trip, she shared her inspiring life story with us. Here's a snippet, but in the show notes, there's a link to her full episode. My name is Angela Rivero. I aspire to inspire before I expire. I'm one of the founders for Sisters Picks Global and Hills for Pads Foundation, and I'm also a chairperson for Crown Trust. So I grew up, I was born rather, and I grew up in Kenya until the age of around 11. And then uh, my family and I relocated to the UK. So I was obsessed with television. Our version of DSTV there is like Sky. It was so bad my mum took it took it away and we only had five channels for like four years of my life because I wouldn't I wouldn't hear when you're talking to me so it was a just a no-brainer uh, I took up media that was the, what I wanted to do prior to that I'd done a tv and video diploma in a college so it was quite clear that I 
media is the route for me. So I got a chance to come in, um, do an internship in Kenya for NTV. For me to like go from a girl obsessed with television to now working for a television station was just a dream that had finally come true for me. So it was also interesting coming back as an adult in Kenya. My plan was to never stay for longer than five months because I was just coming for a break. I didn't think, I, I don't know, I don't think I came with any expectations, but I certainly didn't think I would stay longer than five months. Um, so to know that I just kept extending, then I fell in love. And um, so of course that maybe contributed to me staying longer. If you work in media, you don't get your overtime for it. So it can feel like you're just working and working. I never used to get sick, so I got sick. I was like, it's time for me to get paid my dues. I think I'm beyond an intern here. Like I've got experience. I wanted to like now move out on my own because I was staying with family. And so that just wasn't happening. And so I was like, well, I have options and my time is up. And that is the reason why I left because I was like, I want money, I want a different experience. I was trying to find another job and I couldn't. And so I, I chose to leave thinking that it would be easier for me because now I have like 14, years, 14 months experience of working in media that it would be just an easy transition when I moved back to the UK. And unfortunately it wasn't the case. The, the reality was um, that I would now have to start looking from a job from the bottom, like literally go back to where I began. That's it for this episode of Legally Clueless. You can share this podcast with your friends. You can keep it for yourself. I'm not judging. Just make sure you're here next week for the next episode.